Do celebrities hate their fans? I'm not them, so I don't know. Or maybe I do. Hi, I'm Ro Ramon, the prophet, known for hits such as predicting Little Uzi Vert non-binary era and premonitions of LeBron returning to Cleveland and starting to play basketball. Today we're talking about celebrity musicians. Doja Cat, Frank Ocean, Big Thief, The Lonely Island, Pepsi, Ludacris. Those last three were a lie, but what me and you have, baby, that's the truth. A parasocial relationship where you give me money for making jokes about giving dogs guns and thinking Judy Hopps is kind of hot for a rabbit. I didn't say that. She is built like a pair of AirPod Maxes. We gotta get onto the actual video. Hi, welcome back to a Disney Resort hotel at nightfall, I'm the ghost of the real life Goofy who died from a hunting rifle wound in a car accident. If you subscribe right now, boy, I don't know what I'll do. Maybe I'll vote in my local election, go to a small bookstore, purchase an Americano from a local cafe, take in the community of the Fremont Farmer's Market. Life can be really beautiful, you know. Celebrities, they're just like me and you. We all put our pants on one leg at a time, plus a custom pouch that we use to store the skin tags from our radiation exposure. Being a celebrity simply must be nice. You get money, attention, death threats, texts from DJ Khaled. And if you're gay, Pop Crave and Rap TV will post about it in very different ways. That's a privilege. If you're a famous white person that comes out, Elizabeth Warren and Tulsi Gabbard throw a ticker tape parade and invite Brendan Urie. When I came out as gay, the other guy in the Halo 3 Xbox Live voice jack called me the F slur and team killed me with a needler. Although that might be preferable to the rap TV treatment where a bunch of 27 year old guys whose job history on LinkedIn is Forex followed by freelance grailed ambassador comment, why did it have to get political? Art used to be cool. It got political when the Glow Part 2 released on 9-11. Get fucking real. So I'm about to talk about Doja Cat because let's be honest, she's a little bit trendy right now. <laughs> but before we do any of that, Jesus Christ, what's wrong with me? Am I an engagement shield? No, I have interesting things to say. I promise, me promise. But before we do any of that, we have to thank our sponsor. Hold on there, cowboy. This is ad sponsorship territory. On these parts, we don't say, hey guys, we say, thank you to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. <laughs> Surfshark VPN is a kind of digital lasso that I don't want to do this cowboy voice anymore. Surfshark VPN is a virtual private network that helps protect your data by encrypting all of the information sent between your device and the internet. Imagine this, right? Uh, close your eyes and let me paint a picture. I am Canaletto before the canals. Let my work speak. Okay, so God forbid you're in Canada, a place no one wants to be, and you want to watch your favorite show, but it's not available on the streaming catalog in Canada. Bam, Surfshark VPN. You can transport yourself to one of a hundred countries so that the servers think you're in that place, and then you have access to the libraries from other countries. Or imagine, <laughs> perchance, that you're a public figure like me and you're surfing public Wi-Fi and you don't want people to have access to your passwords if they're trying to be all sneaky. Uh, yeah, bam, Surfshark VPN. I think I'm gonna be secure. My sincerest apologies to any conspicuous burglars wearing black and white striped shirts and a t-shirt with a big bag on it that says passwords. I don't think you're gonna be getting my info today. <laughs> I don't, I'd say you're not getting my info. A lot of people say surfing the internet is just like a commentary video. If you're doing it without help from a VPN, what's the point? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but anyways, thank you so much to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. Go to surfshark.deal slash roramden and use code roramden for an extra three months free. That's this link or the link in the description, plus the code roramden, which in case you weren't aware, it's kind of my name. It's kind of my name. Why am I doing this? Okay, we're going back to the video. Mwah. Doja Cat is a rapper, singer, artist, who's been going through it a bit lately, specifically with her connection to her audience. It all started months ago when she tweeted out her immensely popular records, Planet Her and Hot Pink were mediocre pop cash grabs. Of course, if you like the type of music she was making on those albums, which, you know, I like some of it a good amount, you might feel offended that an artist you directly support and enjoy is insulting your taste, suggesting that your selection is bad, that you're listening to top 40 trash. Listen, this didn't personally affect me because I don't think my music taste is trash. If I hear Imagine Dragons at a local dive, I'm finding the first gen Kindle Fire they're playing Pandora's Fallout Boy radio on, and I'm beating it with a hammer until the cops come. If you put on Hamilton at one of the many functions that I attend, I'm handing out Howard Zinn and Marble Reds before I strangle myself with the aux cord. But music taste is a big part of people's personalities, though for instance, I think there is a great Venn diagram to be made between Taylor Swift fans and uh, people who are uniquely susceptible to joining the cult from Midsommar. Show me Dianetics Taylor's version. Diametrically opposed are the white Drain Gang fans who think that modern medicine was created 
created using Yakubian science. Artistic or musical taste is not only foundational to a person's personality or their sense of self, but it can also be very fragile. People hate it when you insult what they like. Okay, Doja Cat has started to have an adversarial relationship with some of her fans and supporters. There are some detractors of her that thinks that she's been getting kind of cringe, millennial cringe, and I can see where that comes from, but that's not really the heart of the problem that people have with her. She literally said that her two biggest albums were cash grabs that people fell for. She said that she felt like she was making digestible pop hits for children, and numbers don't lie. She has three songs with over a billion streams. She clearly has a very strong pop music presence, and yeah, a lot of attention from huge songs is going to be coming from children, from radio stations, from store playlists and background music, and as an artist, it is understandable that one might feel that that type of thing is humiliating, that it makes you unhappy and unfulfilled. She also seemed to have been in a bit of a self-deprecation spree. She tweeted, I also agree with everyone who said the majority of my rap verses are mid and corny. I know they are. I wasn't trying to prove anything. I just enjoy making music, but I'm tired of hearing y'all say that I can't, so I will. Another one of her tweets, uh, my fans don't call themselves shit. If you call yourself a kitten or fucking kittens, that means you need to get off your phone and get a job and help your parents with the house. She also refused to tell her fans that she loves them because, quote, she doesn't know them. All of that kind of leads us to something like the responses to this tweet about going on tour, where the top response has a whopping 24,000 likes, and it's a fan basically saying, uh, you're just gonna cuss us out and shit on us again in two days. Don't lie to us. And um, how do I put this? Uh, who the fuck cares? Listen, sure, I'm sorry if your favorite pop star has been kind of having a little public freak out and reevaluation and doesn't like her fan culture, but it's not the end of the world that she's encouraging people to not form their identity online and offline around her. That is generally a healthier thing to do than the alternative. Celebrities are not always going to be polite and you don't have to support them. You don't have to conjure up a relationship with them or listen to their music or anything if you don't want to. And I'll speak about this more shortly, but I want to talk about two other artists right now. Frank Ocean, an artist that follows in a long line of great Franks, Sinatra Zappa, the kid from Malcolm in the Middle, that gay turtle. Don't tell me he isn't gay, he dresses like Fred from Scooby-Doo, and Fred is the gayest man I've ever seen. Uh, he, he cried it, but I'm a cheerleader. Frank Ocean is an artist, singer, songwriter, entrepreneur, person who rose to fame in the 2010s for his solo musical career, work as a ghostwriter and membership of hip-hop collective Odd Future. Fun fact, I was also a member of Odd Future during its heyday. They called me Ratneck and would put me in a vacuum-sealed laundry bag and leave me in waste repositories as a prank. It's how I got my superpower a slipped disc. And I'm the one who got Tyler banned from the UK by telling Royal Guards he was a descendant of Guy Fox. But alongside his music, Frank is known for being incredibly elusive, retreating from the limelight routinely. Before his return to the stage this year at Coachella, it had been six years since a public performance and Coachella was a nightmare. Around three hours before Frank's set, he canceled the live stream that was supposed to be broadcast, relegating the experience to either an exorbitantly priced solely in-person affair or one that could only be seen from the streams of people broadcasting the show from the audience. So to clarify, this type of decision that he made doesn't actually prevent people from seeing the set in any meaningful way. Coachella has an average attending audience of 250,000 people, and it's likely that a significant portion of that audience, tens of thousands of people, will attend a headlining act, especially one like Frank's that is the culmination of a six-year wait. What this does prevent is the less invested, less interested audience from watching a show they were interested in more as a cultural pageant performed by one of the most elusive artists in the world. This means that, in fact, canceling the live stream hurts primarily those who were most loyal to Frank in the first place depriving them of quality sound and visuals while they scrounge social media for a decent angle of the stage. Whether or not this was a decision driven by emotion, ego, fear, or insecurity, it is one that clearly separates the audience of Frank Ocean into two parties, financially secure or wealthy fans who were able to attend Coachella and see the performance with all of the costs that that entails, and fans whose economic or temporal realities weren't aligned with Frank's performance. For those people, the experience was demoted even further from a live stream to second-hand recordings with clipped audio and shaky footage. It is frustrating and insulting first and foremost to Frank's most loyal, engaged fans, and second to his poorest and busiest fans. It is also frustrating to fans who were just unable to attend the show, but figured they'd at least be able to enjoy it via live stream. This almost certainly wasn't Frank's intention, but it is an unfortunate consequence. So after that snafu, Frank got on stage and did what everybody thought was a lackluster, underwhelming performance. Everybody was pissed at him, and then through other channels, it was revealed that he had sustained an ankle injury from biking around on the festival grounds, he'd canceled the use of an ice rink and a hundred hockey players the day of the set, resulting in Coachella being forced to deconstruct the set, melt the ice rink, and rebuild the set as Frank wanted it, resulting in major delays to the performance. On stage during the performance, he talked about how Coachella reminded him of his younger brother, who had tragically passed away very young a few years earlier. And all this kind of leads me to the point that 
no, Frank Ocean doesn't hate his fans. No, Doja Cat doesn't hate her fans. They are just complicated people with their own problems and difficulties, their own emotional journeys. Frank had injured himself. He was clearly in a weird, complex, emotional headspace, and shit happens. It does. It is definitely unfortunate and maybe lame, but I don't think something even on this scale is indicative of disdain or hatred for the people who support you. Also, Sometimes fans can be massively overwhelming and difficult to engage with. Uh, enter Big Thief. Big Thief is a really great indie folk band, and they recently released a song called Vampire Empire, which was hotly anticipated by their fans due to it being performed live various times while unreleased, and they released it, a uh, professional recording, and then a bunch of young fans took to TikTok and the internet to say, fuck, they fucking, they ruined it live. Live, it was so much better when it was live. I can't even listen to it. Why didn't, why did they take off this lyric or this instrument? Uh, why did they change the delivery? They they were just tweaking, generally. And I can't emphasize enough how weirdly cruel this is to demand a song from an artist for so long, and then when they give it to you to ignore everything about it and just reprimand them for changing small things you liked from the live performance, which are impossible to recreate perfectly. To musicians, this is a phenomenon known as demo-itis, which is when an artist listens to the demo of their own song over and over and over again, and then they end up losing any sort of conception of what the song is or how it could be better. So when they want to go back and finish it, they can't change anything because they have this set version in their mind that they don't want to break from. Now sure, these fans who were complaining might have been the vocal minority, but they were so vocal that Big Thief had to address it publicly. They had to tweet about it. And I don't know, I think that maybe we have poisoned the well for artist audience interaction in this hyper online internet era, and that artists have started to feel like instead of being in a symbiosis with their fans most of the time, that they're under constant siege or threat, which is just profoundly unhelpful. I think that right now we are able to to focus on artists being maybe frustrating or complicated or uncooperative because we are so eager to expect things from them and we have unlimited access to them in the internet age. And this type of stuff happens commonly. You've probably seen it before. Another example being a smaller artist called Lola Young. Uh, she dropped a song called Don't Hate Me and people were pissed about changes from the live performance to the recorded version. And you know, it's like, of course we can critique and engage with art in so many different ways. But at the end of the day, these people are creating and releasing personal art for us in the way that they want to, and I think we should be remembering that prior to just ripping it apart because we don't like how it's changed. So finally, let's talk about the rigmarole of stan culture. Stan culture referring to obsessively committed online communities of fans, taking the name stan from an Eminem song about an obsessive fan who harasses Eminem and then dies which doesn't feel like a good start to what you're calling yourself as a community. It's like naming a hot air balloon company after a Zeppelin. I think for a second, we should consider the pressure cooker situation of having really dedicated, devoted fans to the point that they essentially deify you. Um, so personally, I have a fan, Miles, thank you, Miles, everybody say thank you, Miles, who runs an updates account for my content on Twitter, and that alone is kind of surreal to me, that somebody likes what I'm doing and cares about it to the extent that they want to document it and preserve it, to let other people know what I'm up to. Um, that times 600 quintillion is what actual famous people, actual celebrities deal with. And some people might say, oh, they're rich, oh, they have security, blah, 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 but it's, I don't think it's as simple as, like, they're wealthy, so it's okay. They are certainly wealthy. Healthy. They certainly make a lot of money off of what they do, and they probably do not have to work another day in their lives if they don't want to. That's a huge privilege. However, whether or not they want it for the rest of their lives, they will have to bear the psychological, social, cultural effects of having obsessive diehard fans who will watch them with a hawk's eye and monitor everything they do, desperate for something that affirms the artist's relationship to the audience. Which is to say that the artist forfeits their ability to be perceived as a real human to these people outside of an artist-audience transactional state. The artist can hold personal relationships, can use their resources and wealth to recede from normal life, but to these people, sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands, sometimes millions or tens of millions, they can never force something authentic to materialize. They can never divorce themselves from the transactional nature of the relationship. And that, to me, is very disturbing. It is, of course, impossible to separate the immense privilege of these people from their circumstances. Their material conditions are eons past the quality of life 99.9% .9 of people on earth will ever experience. But that level of relevance comes at a cost. Unlike a silent entrepreneur or a sheltered billionaire, being a massive artist comes with the prerequisite of being marketable and visible to the extent that when a singer is masked, when their face isn't revealed, isn't plastered on billboards and advertisements, it is of note. Think about Daft Punk or MF Doom. So much of the personas and draw of these artists came from their evasiveness, their mysteriousness, their willingness to hide behind a mask or a pseudonym. So so in defense
sense of Doja Cat, I totally understand where she's coming from. If you're an artist who wanted to find success, uh, find an audience before you dropped what you felt was more personal or intimate music that you were really proud of, it totally makes sense to me that if your ego got to you, you might be inclined to lash out at the people who made the music you didn't feel was your best the most popular. Especially if you, as a very online person, are constantly seeing them post about you, respond to all of your tweets, comment on all of your Instagram posts, and you understand that they are there because of music you don't think is good, or you think is bland or sellout. That being said, it isn't a good look to most people because most people believe that placating fans with praise and content and gratitude is more important than an artist expressing how they feel, even if the artist's feelings are entitled as well. On one end, the audience feels entitled to thanks, feels entitled to time and attention, and the artist feels entitled to exaltation, to having their rude or unfunny behavior excused. Now, it's important to mention that when I speak about these people in this manner, I am not speaking about them as quote-unquote celebrities, as uh, very wealthy people who receive uh, copious amounts of praise, recognition, attention, but rather as loci around which the cultural project of fame, of relevance, is constructed. And that cultural project can absolutely destroy somebody's sense of self, sense of worth, their ability to express how they feel or what they think, and yeah, to an extent, their sanity. You know, somebody like Bjork doesn't attack the paparazzi because they're in a good headspace, because people are interacting with them in a healthy way. I think that fame is uniquely suffocating, and to me, at least, it looks like Doja Cat's lashing out her disrespectful behavior, quote-unquote, is symptomatic of circumstance rather than emblematic of how she feels about people that support her. Nonetheless, it is very difficult to take that perception in stride if you are somebody who really did support her and thought her music was great, and now you feel like not only is she shitting all over you for supporting what she does, but essentially saying that you are stupid for ever enjoying it. You know, a few months ago, I recorded a little collab with somebody, and once we were done, I said, okay, well now all these annoying people will stop asking us to collaborate, like they'll stop annoying me and being weird about it. And then they said, they're not annoying, you know, they're your audience, they are the lifeblood of our career, and they make your livelihood possible, and they're the reason you're here, and I was like, wow, I'm a total dick, that was a total dick thing to say, because I was temporarily completely unaware of like, I, I was blinded by this innate frustration that came with having lots of people I don't know expect things from me, or ask things of me, uh, even just look at me, understand that I'm here. Listen, celebrities are people too is an immensely boring take, which is why that's not really what I'm trying to say. It is obvious that celebrities are people too. What I'm saying is that when we participate in something as an audience member, we should try to remember the cultural project of fame, to remember how it changes people, how it warps reality how it warps the artist and ourself, and how it is kind of a deeply troublesome institution. That's all. That's all I want to say with this section and with the video. Thank you so much to watching. Thank you again to Surfshark for sponsoring. Use the link in the description for that awesome deal. My friend Alexis, who I have shouted out in the past two videos, is still struggling a lot with their bills. So um, they have been suffering ever since a house fire a relapse. They just haven't been able to get financially back on their feet. So if you're looking for somebody to mutual aid today, uh, do them. That was a weird way to phrase it, but thank you so much for watching the video. Um, uh, take care of yourself, take care of others, be kind to yourself, and be kind to others. Uh, that's all. Bye. Hi, welcome back to the patron q and I asked really late for this one, so we only have two questions, so I'm really going to give these ones uh, love and attention. Taco asked, if I had a persona, what animal would I be? Um, somebody's made me one before, and I think I was a deer. Mm, but I think I would be a deer or a cat, or maybe, can I be a hippo, like a baby hippo? Oh boy, what if I, what if I had a, a fursona? What if a lot of people drew me as a, fur, with my fursona? That would be cool. Uh, Alex Miller asks, would you love me if I was a worm? Not, not only would I not love you, I would have no idea what to do with you. I don't know you now. So, I'd be troublesome. I don't know if I would recognize you as a worm. I don't know if I could speak to you, communicate with you. If I could, I think that would sort of be a huge uh, perspective shifting moment in my life. So no, I don't think I would love you if you were, were a worm. And I think it would freak me out a lot if, if you started talking to me. Um, that being said, I uh, really appreciate you supporting me on Patreon. And I hope uh, all of you are having a really lovely time and day and moment in life. Bye.